let us have a better understanding of trauma. The common way trauma is handled is people tend to focus on feelings and try to fix trauma with things like self-love. You cannot self-love whilst you're experiencing trauma. It won't allow it. Sometimes they might throw a bit of thinking in there. Go to the gym, problem solved. Associated with trauma are usually issues with a sense of self, the loss thereof, esteem, identity, worth. Self-awareness and identity are built partly on memory. You might hear about people identifying with their problems. They are their trauma. They are the victim. Trauma, self and memory are linked. Where self and memory are damaged, trauma is produced as a replacement and becomes all there is. A person cannot live and be in existence whilst there is trauma pressing down on them. It's no good trying to change trauma or the self by just changing memories or replacing them if the way they are created in the first place isn't any different. You would just be in a cycle of repetition and slowly accumulating more damage. We don't see lasting change because attention is misplaced. If it is deliberate, it is with the intention of avoidance, which is something trauma is very skilled at. The advice of keeping busy should be taken with caution as although it can be useful for progression, it can easily be a method to sweep things under the rug under a guise of productivity. Intention is paramount and will make itself known. A conscious definition should be observed in order to make a commitment to a precise decree. Ambiguous or vague remarks are a convenience to slipping back to old ways. There is nothing wrong with saying you are busy dealing with trauma or things like anxiety or depression. Speak the truth if you are ever to grow. Be careful not to bring trauma with you to your endeavors, otherwise it will taint them like a rebound relationship. If you are truly serious about recovery, you will be determined to do so no matter how terrified at the prospect you will be. You must allow the trauma to die so that you aren't living its death. What is trauma? Trauma is like the artifact of injury. It is a survival mechanism to manage and cover over that injury, albeit poorly. In a lot of cases, it must be obscured to protect you from it, kept hidden. Hence, it can be hard to accept that someone, you perhaps, are experiencing trauma. You might not even realize it because of how well it can mask injury at times. You might just think it's normal, or just how it is. Maybe you say to yourself, life is supposed to be about suffering. You might have some awareness of sensitive, painful areas, but not fully acknowledge how deep it actually goes, because that in itself triggers pain. You become aware enough to know to avoid it. Just like muscle memory of touching a hot stove, Trauma is the mental memory reminding you not to touch emotional pain. It is pain avoidant. So there is a use for trauma and arguably some positives. Depending on the type of trauma, it can help desensitize you so that you aren't paralyzed with shock. Like a fork in the road, it can teach you to be proactive in your response or teach you to become debilitated. Fight or flight. Protection Once activated, it relies on you to make the decision to turn it off. It has no awareness of safety. It is attuned to danger. It keeps you in a state of preparedness, ensuring you can survive even if it's an uncomfortable, unhappy experience. This is an additional stress. It does not care about your quality of life. Its job is to defend and attack any and all threats. It's trying to keep things stable so no more injury can occur. Which makes it difficult to alter because what are you going to do without it? You mean you have to start protecting yourself? 
no longer rely on a savior and you must stand up to it. You forget it is a basic failsafe because you've been praising it as a super powerful being. Funny where you place your self esteem. At its core, it's scared, fragile, irresponsible, and actually kind of infantile. As trauma takes over operations of your cognition and subdues your conscious awareness, you become a passenger, passively witnessing yourself doing distasteful things out of character. This comes as part of a dislocation or detachment from your sense of self and reality. It may feel eerily like trauma has taken on its own personality. You start to build a trusting yet toxic relationship with it. It looks out and cares for you. It keeps you from being alone. It understands you. It accepts you. It is a friend now, a partner. You don't want to abandon it because you don't want to be abandoned. It becomes everything to you and starts to take on a life of its own. Trauma has overridden your authority. It gets to live and you don't because it has been given the keys to your life. You allow it to continue whilst you're disorientated and mystified. It's too much for you to take in and you feel always one step behind what's going on, being pulled along seamlessly helpless to stop it. By now you might have noticed the similarities to narcissism. This persona that the trauma has taken is what is narcissistic, not the person. The person, if they are aware enough, will be ego dystonic. They won't like being at the mercy of their trauma and they'll recognize there is something wrong with them. Even if they aren't fully aware, there are still distinctions that separate the two. A narcissist has it in their bones. You could say trauma will try to mimic narcissism if it will help them. False self-care. Bad habits become part of this false self-care and it is reinforced further with false beliefs. With a strong sense of guilt anyway, they know what they are doing is wrong, like drinking, but they will continue because the trauma defense system demands it. They may have tried to stop and quickly get uncomfortable. The trauma panics and screams at them. See, this isn't good, we are losing control. Get back onto the drink as soon as possible and restore normality. And in that moment of weakness, they may feel relieved and safe, quickly followed by things like shame, disappointment and self-hatred. Obviously these sentiments feed into the false belief, but they serve to help keep the trauma defense system optimal and relevant. For it to work, they need to feel incapable of looking after themselves. Note how trauma doesn't try to stop these thoughts, but it will try to stop thoughts of overcoming challenges. They have instructed trauma to protect them even from themselves. A silent contract is made. In a way, Trauma is a system built in place of an inadequate system. Refer to cognitive function stacks. We see this in how trauma affects people differently. They are using a system or a function stack to deal with the process of trauma differently. If we understand our system and compare it to others, we should in theory be able to make adjustments that better equip ourselves to tackle issues before trauma has to take over management. This is the reason for focusing on the MBTI lately. As a general bit of advice, it doesn't have to be regarding trauma. Whatever inferior function you have, it might be useful to observe how that function behaves when it is in the dominant function slot. Resistance Shaped by the ego, trauma is the protocol for keeping a status quo. Positive change, healing or help is met with resistance, ego defenses like denial. It gets to work on intercepting help as a threat. It does not recognize positive, but it does recognize change. Anything that resembles changing what in theory is supposed to be a safe haven must therefore be a threat. 
a cornered animal will bite. Help, therefore, is not welcomed and has a hard job to get through. The ego also does not recognize its shortcomings and believes it has everything under control with the trauma regime. The trauma, hidden inside its fortress of sensory, forms a hard shell around the injured person. Critical thinking is walled off, so it can't be easily accessed. It would also interfere with the sanctuary. Emotions are used to create a barrier. The person believes additional information such as critical thinking would cloud their judgment and they stay stuck in a state detached from reality where it is safe. Mental faculties are reduced to pull in resources that feed into the trauma in an attempt to make it more omnipresent and unstoppable. The cost is that the person becomes instinctive, survivalistic, hostile, the list goes on. If possible, avoid using distortions as your guide and clear a path. Critical thinking can then make itself known and become apparent. Those moments where the penny drops. Trying to force your own version of critical thinking is the ego's clever way of tricking you into substituting one distortion for another in order for it to continue being in charge. You see, the ego has no problem with lying to you and will switch out whatever narrative to keep you compliant. Trauma bonding. Trauma alone isn't enough. There are emotional ups and downs, so outside help is required to balance and bring an illusion of regulation. And it needs to be in the form of delusion as a real counterbalance, i.e. logic or healthy people, would be incompatible for the trauma to continue. It would bring about change. People who actually try to help, who you could argue are realistically bonded, like friends and family, are pushed away as unsuitable for the trauma bond symbiosis, unless they contort themselves to be engulfed. Normal people are seen as not understanding because they don't share this trauma delusion. Thus the trauma bond is made or based on delusion. It is a shared fantasy. It's not a real bond, which means when choosing to live in reality, the bond will be seen for what it is and fizzle out. In its place would be the awareness of dependency. It is a dependency bond. This is another reason why hanging out with other damaged people is preferred because there is common ground. But this won't help getting someone out of their despair, rather it will help keep them there. They look for trauma bonding because they want someone to enable the trauma. It should be noted that trauma bonding doesn't have to be with just an individual, but could be an entire community, or even on societal levels. Look at mass psychosis. Anyway, many suggest this is the narcissist's doing. You are a powerless victim to their spellbinding. Get this idea out of your head. The sooner one takes responsibility for their trauma bond that they created as a way for them to cope, the quicker they'll realize they do have the power to break it. The narcissist just answered the advertisement. To even say I'm trauma bonded is coping language indicating a desire to merge and not let go. It is also a bit of a misconception. It suggests the narcissist was equally in a relationship sharing the experience and trauma. Or as a translation, I desperately need someone that I'm going to suggest I'm not alone in this. The narcissist isn't trauma bonded to anyone silly, they're bonded to their fantasy. In closing, take a moment to appreciate trauma. It grew at a time of great need. It has some merit. Yes, sometimes it leads to disastrous results. But it would be foolish to approach trauma as a survival system with the intent to demolish it. It would be better to use it properly because there may be times in the future where it will be needed again. I am suggesting to see it and use it as a tool, and to use this tool well. Survivors, a poorly named term, in time look at trauma as an opportunity for great learning and growth. When you can understand what it is trying to achieve, it can be forgiven. 
you are not your trauma. I know it can be all consuming and like some big storm over you. It may seem like that because you are still trying to understand. And as we continue this series of videos, you will start to be more hands on and this imaginative storm will give way to the fact that the sun is always shining. Thank you for listening.